make sure that you, if you're going to reject Christianity, it's because you reject Jesus, not his followers. His followers are very imperfect. We're all in process. That's good for you as the skeptic, because that means if you join us, you get to be imperfect and you get to be in process too. And so it's kind of like what you're saying, the Simpsons, we divide ourselves in what part of town or what county we live in. We live in these bubbles and then we become more extreme in our thinking because we're not challenged by other people who we know, our neighbors, our coworkers who think differently than us. And when you don't live around people who think differently than you, people who vote differently than you, what happens is, is you start falling for caricatures or kind of extreme uh, uh, visions of what the other side is like. So imagine a church in the United States that cared about Jesus more than politics, that spoke truth to power. But the church misses that opportunity to speak to the world when we are just as divided as everyone else. What's up, my friends? My name is Beto Gudino. Welcome back to another episode of the Christian Podcast in America. I am here to save American souls and American souls only. But hold up, let me finish this game first. You're on my screen. There we go. There we have All it. Right. Keith we Simon break. is on the screen. Welcome, Keith. Sorry about that. You know about glitches, don't you? I My whole life is a glitch, Beto. Ah. I, I, <laughs> I have the spiritual gift of making easy things complicated, so I'm I'm totally with you. Awesome. Well, welcome to the show, and to kick us off with today's episode, well, we have, as you know, the Emoji Tombola, the belifo meter, and today you get to pick one of these emojis and one idea. So, out of the five emojis, Keith... Which one are you resonating with the most and what is the idea behind it? Well, that's kind of easy for me is that I always resonate with a skeptical person. Uh, I, I'm skeptical myself. And when we wrote the book, uh, Truth Over Tribe, we were writing it for people who might be skeptical about the church because the way the church has interacted with politics. So I... If you've noticed some of the articles lately, the uh, church attendance is declining. People who call themselves Christians is declining. And, you know, that's a complicated story, but I think at least part of it is about how the church has so aligned with political parties that it's turned a lot of people off. And I, I'm one of them. I'm with them. So I'm a bit skeptical of church, which is weird for a pastor to say, <laughs> but I, I'm with you. Awesome. All right. And for that, the belifo meter is skeptical emoji. I love it. I'm all about skepticism when it comes to the church. That's why I'm a missionary here in America, because I see a lot of that happening, too. And yes, a lot of our our late talks that I've had with authors and you know people on the political spectrum and arena here in the United States has been for sure American churches in decline and division among among partisanship and I love the fact that you guys have this this book and podcast called Truth Over Tribe and I was thinking about this because um I think the internet It's all about opinions. When I think of a podcast, even the other day I was saying to to a politician, I was asking him, how can I how can I monetize my podcast? And this is what he said. He said, Beto, you need to have an opinion. You mm -hmm. need to have an opinion and like stand on your opinion and make everybody like alienate everybody to your opinion or against your opinion and then you'll make money. And I was like, okay, I'm I'm not gonna make money. This is <laughs> this is this is not about making money then, uh, but well, it is about the yeah. What were you going to say? Well, I, I I totally understand where he's coming from, right? Because mm. the way you make a name for yourself is by coming down hardcore for one group and against another group, and then a lot of churches are doing that. I mean, you have churches mm. who are growing that because they're identifying either with what people call the MAGA churches, make America great again. 
uh, churches, or they're becoming, you know, progressive, hard left churches. And it's almost like this church growth strategy that's circulating out there among churches. So the same thing he's telling you about your podcast, I think pastors are hearing, and some of them are kind of running with that strategy. Wow, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I, I've, I've listened to a few of that. And I think that's even maybe one of the reasons why some pastors are quitting, because I feel like they they don't want to do either, right? They're, they're like, I'm here to preach the gospel, but the pressure maybe to say, you got to you gotta stand on this opinion. Uh, maybe some of that pressure is what's moving them to say, well, this is not for me then. Because I, I feel it even, like I said, as a podcaster, I feel like I, I don't necessarily feel like I want to be on an opinion. You know, I follow Jesus. Um, and I think that's that's kind of like what the book is wrestling with, right? The idea that there's tribes, that there's there's partisanship, there's Democrats, there's uh, MAGA followers, there's Republicans, and almost like this idea that the kingdom of Jesus is 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 it's not in any of those camps. It's a it's a thing of its own. It's the kingdom of God. It's outside of that realm. It's a it's its own political vision. So what do you have to say when when you mean? Jesus is political, but not partisan. Yeah, I think you've hit on a lot of really good things there, Beto, is that the, the fracturing that we're seeing in our society is happening within the church. And people are aligning with their own group and their own belief system. And they're sitting in their media bubble, their social media bubble, their friendship bubble. We're, we're living around people who think like us more than ever in the history of our country. And that fracturing that's happening nationally is happening inside the church. And so what's happening is people are starting to go to churches where everybody kind of thinks like them. And they're starting to allow their political allegiances to trump their uh, allegiance to Jesus. And, and that's kind of got us into this problem where Christians are, are are now seen as people who are a political movement more than the movement of, about Jesus. And that's a pretty sad situation for the church because Jesus has always been about his kingdom, not, not a, a political kingdom. So l- let me see if I can explain. Jesus is political, but not partisan, means that Jesus has a politic. He wants to bring his kingdom here. So that's why he taught us to pray, uh, may your will be done, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. But that his kingdom doesn't align with just the Republican or the Democratic or the Libertarian or the Green Party platform. Jesus's kingdom doesn't fit in any of our political platforms. He's bigger than that. He's not trying to be the president of the United States. Mm. He's, he's, he's not interested in a four-year term. He's the eternal king. He, he rules over the whole world. And he has an agenda, a kingdom agenda that we need to follow. So as, as Christians, we're going to always be a little politically homeless, not ever quite fitting in any political tribe. It's fine to think of yourself as a Democrat or Republican or, or maybe another party or, or, or an independent. All that's fine. What's not OK is to allow those political allegiances to become greater than your allegiance to Jesus. Hmm. OK, that makes a lot of sense. And so you have this phrase that I was resonating with so much on the book, Truth Over Tribe, which is paired to basically your podcast that you guys are doing, Truth Over Tribe. And it says this, there's no way a single human could know everything. That's why we store knowledge in community. We store knowledge in community. That was so epic. I love that phrase because it it does feel like as humans... We resonate with opinions as much as I'm saying, you know, I feel like I, I don't necessarily have an opinion. I follow Jesus. But as humans, that's basically the idea behind persuasion, right? That that we store knowledge in community and therefore the knowledge that we resonate with is the knowledge that we incline to because it, it feels like we can belong to this set of opinions. And that's the whole idea of persuasion, that we can persuade somebody else to 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 move into our tribe, to move into our political vision, right? And it's almost like Jesus, like what you're saying is Jesus comes and he's persuading us into a, a, a different type of tribe altogether. 
But it's so interesting that almost as humans, you know, even when I think some people will will remember this, The Simpsons, the show where in, in one of the episodes, I remember like the foundation of the city. And one of them says, I'm going to go to this other town, Shelbyville, I think, because I want to marry my cousins. And the other part of town saw that as immoral. I'm like, we, we can't do that. We need to live in Cassidy, in purity and all of that. Right. And they build uh, Springfield. And I think, wow, what a what a portrayal of exactly what's going on in America. It's almost like it's 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 kind of like two camps on morality where some people say, you know, it's we we, we kind of need to explore and do whatever we want. And that's where, you know, the, the sexual conversation comes in. And some other people say, I'm conservative. Uh, no, let's live in purity and that. But I feel like the Simpsons got it right. I mean, as an American, do you feel like... Um, do you feel like those two opinions are the only ones out there in a sense? Well, what, what's happening is that we are beginning to sort ourselves by our beliefs. So a, a, a landslide county is a county in which one presidential candidate won by at least 20% of the vote. So that's by a lot, right? Uh, in a landslide county, there is one person, blue or red, that that really won that county decisively. And, you know, back in the 1980s, there weren't many landslide counties. But as you've watched the map change, the election map change, what you find now is that over 57% of Americans live in a landslide county. That means 57% of Americans live around people who vote and think like they do. And so mm -hmm. it's kind of like what you're saying, the Simpsons, we divide ourselves in what part of town or what county we live in. We live in these bubbles and then we become more extreme in our thinking because we're not challenged by other people who we know, our neighbors, our coworkers who think differently than us. And when you don't live around people who think differently than you, people who vote differently than you, what happens is, is you start falling for caricatures or kind of mm -hmm. extreme uh, uh, visions of what the other side is like. And you begin to think that the other side are these evil, horrible people who are out to destroy the country, when really most of them are just trying to raise their family, go to work, pay their bills, maybe take a vacation, just the kind of things that that ordinary Americans do. And, and you see this even play out in, in the Bible where you have uh, Jesus is going into Jerusalem with his disciples and they stop at a Samaritan village and the Samaritans won't let them stay there because they're Jewish. So you already see there's tribalism there. And and the uh, some, so the Jesus' disciples, James and John, they ask Jesus, hey, should we call down fire on these people? Hmm. Now, it's kind of weird, right, to think that you're going to ask the Prince of Peace if you should napalm an entire village of people, right? It's kind of a weird thing, but they do it. And Jesus rebukes them. But you can see what happened is that Samaritans and Jews, they didn't know each other. They lived in separate places, separate villages. They worshiped at the different temples. They didn't interact in the supermarket or wherever they hung out. And so James and John, they didn't know any Samaritans. They knew a lot about them, but they didn't know them. You know, they got the rumor about the Samaritans off of their version of social media, right? And and so and so they wanted to kill them because they thought, oh, these are bad people. But think about this. Jesus goes to Jerusalem not to defeat the, the Romans, but to die for the Romans, not to defeat his enemies, but to die for them. And some of those Samaritans, they end up coming to believe in Jesus. And so James and John are worshiping in the same church with people they wanted to kill a few weeks earlier. And, and, and I think that when we sort ourselves by, by our church or by our county or by our social media uh, feed or by our uh, cable news bubble that we're all in, I, I think we end up uh, not knowing people who are different than us. We don't have friendships across the political divide. And we end up uh, not liking people and we end up speaking about them in harsh terms instead of building friendships. That's that's what we need to do is learn from one another and 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 be kind to one another and try to persuade one another, but not divide and hate each other. Mm -hmm. Okay, so not division. And when you talk about in the book, you say that the church is kind of like camping on these tribes. And then you say one way in which you know which church, um, like kind of what, what camp they're on is because of the flag they 
they wave outside of their building. So you say you'll know that uh, that a church is more maybe liberal if there's a rainbow flag outside of their building. You'll know that a church is more Republican if there's a American flag outside of their building. And that's so interesting to me as even as an outsider, even though I've been here in the U.S. for for 16 years or so. Uh, but it's so interesting to think that that churches, like you said, you know, churches are 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 almost like reflecting society instead of being like the opposite, right? Of society starting to or or the church impacting society. I feel like the culture is impacting the church, right? And the mm-hmm. church is alienating to these two camps, and that's. I feel like it's so interesting to think that when it comes to when it comes to like this 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 um ideologies or whatever it might be uh persuasions ideological persuasions that the church is camping on either one and it's almost like reflecting that same sentiment of the culture so in a sense you're saying that the the like how does the church break out of that how does the church like become actual followers of Jesus rather than reflecting the culture what have you experienced in terms of like this is this is how the church actually becomes the church and they don't wave the flag of the rainbow flag or the american flag they wave the jesus flag the i don't know is that a white flag what is the the flag of jesus look like his banner well uh, we pastor patrick and i who wrote the the book truth over tribe with me uh we are pastors at a church that is politically diverse we are a a blue county, a blue city in the middle of a red state. So our state usually votes Republican, but our county and where we live usually votes Democratic. And so that means that we are around people who have a wide variety of opinions. And thankfully, by God's grace, we've been able to uh, build a church made up of people of all kinds of different political loyalties. And it's hard these days to have a politically diverse church. And so one of the things that that if you're going to have a politically diverse church or a politically diverse friend group, what you're going to have to do is see that Jesus is greater than your uh, political uh, allegiances. So, for example, the, the kingdom of God is not going to come in through the next president. It's only going to come when Jesus returns. And I think a lot of us put our hopes in a a political party, like thinking if that political party gets in power, then everything will be okay. And and I'm guilty of the same thing. I mean, I'm a recovering Mm -hmm. tribalist myself. I remember not too long ago. Well, I remember back in the, in the early nineties when the Republicans took over the house of representatives and I thought, man, this is awesome. I was in the backyard of my fr- friend's house watching the election returns come in. And when the Republicans were declared the, the majority, I ran around. That's November in the Midwest. It's cold. I took off my shirt, ran around the backyard yelling and screaming. And I was <laughs> goofy, right? Just to have fun. But at the same time, I think I really bought into this lie that if the Republicans were in charge, everything was going to be okay. And my co-author Patrick is is younger than me, and and he had the same experience with Obama, where he thought if Obama is elected, everything's going to be okay. But I think a little wisdom, a little reading of your Bible, and a little just experience in life shows you that that there's no political party that's going to advance God's kingdom here, and that's mm-hmm. why I think all Christians have to feel a little bit politically homeless. Mm-hmm. In other words, you can be identified. In other words, you can identify as a Republican or a Democrat. That's fine. But but y- y- you're never going to be fully on board with them because no political party captures Jesus's kingdom ethic, like the Sermon on the Mount or any of Jesus's teaching. Mm. So I, I consider myself homeless politically in that I, I can't really identify with either party. In the last couple presidential elections, I, I didn't vote for either major candidate. And the last time I voted for Kanye, because uh, I thought, yeah, Jesus is king. And I thought, well, I think he gets it more than the other two. <laughs> so, so you know, you, you know, other people, they vote for whoever they think is best. And that's great. I'm not questioning people's votes. I'm just saying that I didn't feel comfortable putting my nickel down for either candidate. Mm, wow. So that's so interesting because from my vantage point, like I said, I've been here 16 years and I can vote. Like I've, I've, 
I'm just I'm not a citizen of this country, and okay. so I don't I have no vote, and it's so interesting that that even as you're saying, you know, we have people in our church, and it's hard to make churches have like a balanced political spectrum within the attenders of the church, but it seems to me like at the end of it all, is this tribe. Uh, tribalism about voting like is that the ultimate goal that people will vote a certain way is that is that is that what it comes down to like like i want your vote to be directed in this in this way or direction um because for people like me i feel like i'm, I'm undocumented you know i've been here 16 years and i feel like well what what voice do i have if i have no vote right um What voice do I have as a as a as a church person when I feel like I can't be on either? I, I feel a little bit like you, but almost like because I'm 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 undocumented, right? I feel like like I'm a what you say homeless, politically homeless. So I feel like I can't be on either camp, but yet there's all this pressure to like I want your vote. Is that what you're witnessing? Like vote is the ultimate goal. Well, clearly, that's what the elected officials, the politicians, want from from Christians. And what happens is Christians start to play that game a little bit, and they think the politicians are really interested in Christianity or the health of the church. But surely, we're wisening up to the fact that politicians will tell people whatever they need to tell them to get their vote, to get elected. And so you'll have presidential candidates go and make all these promises about how they're going to fight for Christians, or they're going to uh, uh, restore the authority of the church and the culture, or they're going to, you know, uh, uh, make it so that everybody says Merry Christmas instead of Happy uh, Holiday, whatever it is. Yes. <laughs> They've all got these things that they're promising and Christians go for it. They they buy it and they think, oh, I've got to get this person elected. Otherwise, my rights are going to be trampled on. Now, look, I'm all for uh, Christians being involved in politics and I'm all for that 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 we make sure that there's a, a, a religious liberty in our country. That's great. But I want to remind us that Christianity grew in Rome under pagan Roman Caesars. Christianity is growing in communist China right now. Christianity grows and thrives in the most difficult places where there is no religious liberty. God is not limited uh, to only work in places where there's a United States Constitution that grants Christians uh, certain rights. Sometimes it's when Christians are persecuted. Sometimes it's when Christians are, are, are killed that they find that the faith grows the most. And so... Uh, I, I, I'm more interested in the health of the church than I am in the health of our country. Mm. I, I hope for both. I want both. I want both the United States to thrive and the church to thrive. But my emphasis is on, on following Christ in his church, not getting sucked up into the political squabble of the day. So I, I think if Christians will, will, will take a step back and say, hey, look, Jesus is my king. Jesus is who gets my loyalty. And then secondarily, I am a Republican or a Democrat. Secondarily, I'm part of this or that nationality, this or that country. Secondarily, then I'm a part of this generation. But Jesus, he's the one who gets my ultimate loyalty. Mm, wow, that's so good because now the question is, why should I give my loyalty to Jesus? Like you were talking about Jesus's teachings and the Sermon on the Mount, So what does he have to say that it's better than it's it's more more it's primary to to giving my vote to either side of political spectrum? What have you witnessed as a as a follower of Jesus that you say your allegiance to Jesus is more important? Even the health of the church is more important. I, I saw something the other day that said that when we use Jesus as king, when we call Jesus the king, that It's kind of it turns people off, or they don't quite understand it. It's 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 religious language, and I I think here's what the the problem we have is that uh, the Bible says that Jesus is the King of the whole universe, but when we hear King, especially as Americans, we're resistant 
because our country started by overthrowing the British king, right? Mm -hmm. And when we hear king, we think of someone who monopolizes power and who maybe uh, taxes people uh, too much and, and starts all kinds of crazy wars. When we think of king, we think of a negative thing, not a positive thing. And, and so what do we do with that? Well, the reason that we don't like kings is because kings uh, are, are about themselves. They're self-oriented. But what if we had a wise king who, who knew the answers to the problems that human beings face? What if we had a loving king who was willing to give his life for others? What if we had a sacrificial king? What if we had a humble king? What if we had a king that uh, uh, built his kingdom in which everybody is invited to and everybody has an opportunity to flourish? We would want that kind of king, but that's the kind of king that Jesus is. He is the king who died for others. He's the king who didn't try to defeat his enemies, but gave his life for his enemies and invites all of his enemies to become his followers. So Jesus is the king that our world longs for, that our world needs. He knows how to solve the problems that human beings face. Wow. So he in so the interesting thing too is that he is if he is the king, so one, I mean the the first question maybe as as we wrestle with skeptical is it's even like, okay, I might get that, but at least the other guys I vote for, I see them and I see their performance. And when I think of Jesus, it's I guess if I'm skeptical, I think, well, it's it's kind of like a made up story. Like where is Jesus now? Right? He died two thousand years ago. So how can I follow somebody I don't see? Maybe I like the idea of God. Maybe I like the idea that there's there's a being out there. But how can I follow somebody that that it's not it's not on a platform telling me if you follow me? I mean, maybe the Bible, right? Maybe people need to go to the Bible. Uh but it's not necessarily on a platform or on TV or on media saying, these are my ideologies, this is my opinion, follow me, necessarily, right? It, it kind of like comes through the voice of the church, and I think that's where the the challenge, It's it, we're wrestling with that challenge, you know, what what part of the church, um, church's voice is Jesus speaking through the church, and what part of the church's voice is just human voice, right? Something mm -hmm. along those lines. Yeah, those are real issues that, that we have to deal with. So let's start where you did, and that is that there are all these political candidates and celebrities, movie stars, sports stars, and they're all out there, uh, very visible. We see them every day, and and, and they're making uh, uh, promises that if we follow them, we can be like them in some way, or they can solve our problems. So why follow Jesus when there are real people here who are are more immediate to us. And I, I think we should just maybe start by asking, well, how's it going with them? I mean, are politicians really solving the problems that you have? Because we're getting more prosperous, but I don't think any of us are happier. Like mm -hmm. medicine, technology, travel, all that has made advances, but people aren't happier today. Well, why is it that we live in the land of abundance and yet we feel so empty inside. So maybe it's time to look somewhere else. Maybe it's time to at least go back to Jesus and evaluate his claims. Who did he claim to be? And is it reasonable to believe that what he said is true? Mm -hmm. And I think as people go back and explore the evidence, I think they're going to find that uh, Jesus is pretty persuasive. And that when you hear who he claimed to be, and you look at the evidence, you're going to go, man, I, I want to give him a shot. It's not like I've got some, some other great option. All these other things are failing me. I might as well at least consider Jesus. But you're right. The church sometimes gets in the way of people following Jesus. Like I've heard people say before, I'd love Jesus. It's his church I don't like. And I, I get that to some extent. I mean, I'm cynical too, and we all see the problems inside the church. And so I think Christians need to, uh, you know, sober up a little bit and be more committed to following Jesus. But to the person out there who's skeptical and who's asking that question, I, I think I'd say this, is that is that 
make sure that you, if you're going to reject Christianity, it's because you reject Jesus, not his followers. His followers are very imperfect. We're all in process. And uh, that's good for you as the skeptic, because that means if you join us, you get to be imperfect and you get to be in process too. Jesus is at work in our life, but all of our lives are changing more slowly than they than we wish they were. We wish we were further along than we are. I wish the church was more consistent. And the church has been wrong about a lot of things. And for that, if the church has hurt you, I sincerely apologize for how it has hurt you. I'm very sad to hear that. Um, but don't throw out Jesus because some of his followers were idiots. Don't turn away from the the way, the truth, and the life just because some of his followers hurt you. Try to separate those if it's possible. Mm, Wow. Okay, I love that. And I love how you say Jesus has a persuasion, right? And I was thinking about this, about assumptions. So you guys are with truth over tribe. And let's say the assumptions are if if you're on the left... My assumption is that you will behave this way. So my expectations are already clear on this camp behaves this way. These are the results. And then on the other end, people have the same thing. They're, they have the assumption that this side, this is how they behave. These are the results. And the interesting thing is that when I think of assumption, I was reading somewhere in a book that it said, um, assumption is the lowest level of knowledge. Assumption is the lowest level of knowledge. And I resonate with that so much because even in the book, you have some statistics where you say that Democrats think, you know, let's just say 80% of of uh, Republicans think like this, when in reality, you know, when, when it comes down to actually making the measurements and all of that, um, you know, Democrats think only 20% think that way or something like that, right? Where... People make the assumption that all their behavior is like this, and in reality, it's way less than that. So that's, I mean, when we think of assuming a result, I can't help but think of, and this is kind of like back to the Bible, right? But uh, the book of Acts, where people are... Uh, I guess the, the, the followers of Jesus, right? It says that the Spirit will fall on them and then they will be witnesses. And how that looks like is that tongues of fire fall on them and they start speaking in different languages. And then the people that are around start listening to those and say, and hear him talk about the, like the, the miracles of God or how glorious God is in their own languages. And that is so interesting to me because I feel like that... That's almost like the unexpected result when it comes to following Jesus, right? When you have camps, you assume and you say, this is the result. This is the behavior. Nothing's going to change. But when you follow Jesus, even the fact that there's something like the tongues of fire, that's totally unexpected. Like nobody thought, oh, wow, the disciples of Jesus are going to come to me and say this, right? They, they couldn't put them on one camp or the other. They came and they spoke in their own language, totally unexpected. So that gives me hope as we bring kind of like this conversation to uh, getting to the closer. Is, is, is that kind of like the hope? I mean, for me, I, I think I see that as the hope, almost like the church is the great unexpected of, of either camp. Right. But in a sense, I feel like people already have a, an expectation of the church. That's where you say, you know, maybe maybe you've been hurt by the church. But can the church almost like be in a new Pentecost of some sort where we are following Jesus, we are praying together and then something new happens that people finally see, wow, these guys have these these guys know what it's i mean they just spoke to me in a way that i've never heard it before they spoke in my own language and i wonder what that language is for our culture today maybe it's not necessarily like like english right but maybe there's there's oh, i don't know a universal language music uh, arts uh something else like that uh what do you have to say to that do you see that also as hope or or am i just like <laughs> making it up or as a pastor what do you think of that 
Well, I, I like the concept that you're trying to get at, I think, in that when people heard uh, uh, the, the, the apostles speaking in their own language back at Pentecost, that there was credibility that came with that, that, that all these different people from different backgrounds that spoke different languages heard God in their language. And it caused them to want to follow Jesus. And it, it brought unity to them. I mean, the early church was divided. Tribalism isn't new. We talked mm. about the Jews and the Samaritans, but the Jews and Gentiles were constantly at odds. And you find whole books of the New Testament that address that issue. And almost every letter Paul writes, he's addressing this issue of, of uh, one group against the other, what we might call us versus them. He says in uh, Ephesians 2 that he has broken down the dividing wall so that different kinds of people can worship together. So imagine a church in the United States that cared about Jesus more than politics, that spoke truth to power, who would say to Republicans and Democrats, you've got this right and this wrong, and who who loved one another very differently so that you had people of every race, people of different socioeconomic backgrounds, all worshiping in the same church, people who voted differently, of course. And so wouldn't that be a powerful church, a church that we could look at the world and say, hey, look what's wrong with with you guys. You're fracturing, you're squabbling, you're attacking one another. But here in Jesus, we have found something that is greater and that we share in common than we uh, or then divide us. I, I think there's something powerful about that. But the church misses that opportunity to speak to the world when we are just as divided as everyone else. Hey, w- one one quick story here is that uh, we really are committed to being a church that is for our community. And it doesn't matter you know, if you believe in Christ or not, if you uh, are straight or LGBTQ, we're, we're going to be for you. We want you to do well in life. So for example, uh, one year we said, we're going to find out who's on our utility disconnect list in our city. And everybody on that list is getting ready to have their utilities disconnected because they don't have finances. So we raised over $400,000 and paid at our church and paid off everybody's utility debt so that nobody's utilities would be disconnected uh, that winter. We, we also did something the same thing with medical debt. And we paid off the medical debt of people living in, you know, and struggling financially. We paid off all their medical debt for 38 counties in our state. Because we want to be a church that's what we're known for. And what we're known for is loving people, caring about people, being generous. We don't compromise on Jesus. We can't compromise on Jesus. He's our hope. He's the one that that gives us life. He's the one that, that energizes us. But his love is to be shared with everybody. And everybody is welcome to come follow this Jesus with us. Wow, that is amazing. I love that. Those stories are are so hopeful. And I think I love the fact that you said um, uh, we want to be a church known for what we are for. So I resonate a lot with that, you know, because sometimes when it comes to my, you know, people may be asking me my opinion on whatever issue, right? But right now, maybe the issues are kind of like LGBT and around those themes. Sure. And even when it comes to the church, it's like, is your church affirming or is your church non-affirming, right? Things like that. And it's like, wow, uh, I think I'm, I'm people affirming, right? <laughs> I, I think that's, right. that's what it comes down for me. And so anyways, I want to end with this because my camera has a false. So it shut down on its own. The eternal fight for us here in the media industry, it's always going to be equipment possessed by the devil. <laughs> <laughs> it's Satan. <laughs> Always Satan. It's always Satan. Okay. Uh, Okay, so back to the emojis. Okay, Keith. So to summarize the episode with our emojis, what would be the most blasphemous idea you can think of when it comes to, to camping on either tribe of the political spectrum? It's blasphemous to put your confidence in a president instead of in King Jesus. All right, I love that. Let's go to a skeptical. What are you skeptical of or where do you see skepticism played out? 
I think non-Christians are rightly skeptical of the church when we divide over partisan loyalties. Inspire idea. I think we can inspire our uh, communities to follow Jesus if we show that what we have in common in Jesus is greater than the things that this world wants us to divide over. Love it. Okay, and this is a holy idea. I think we can show the holiness of God when we give our lives to sacrifice for our community, when we give our time, our money, our talent, when we give that on behalf of those in our community who are hurting, I think that we show that God is holy. Love it. And finally, the most divine idea you can think of. Well, the most divine idea that I think of when it comes to truth over tribe is that Jesus is the eternal king. He reigns over all things. He deserves every allegiance of every human being because he is the king who gave his life for us. There you have it, my friends. What an amazing episode with our friend Keith Simon from Truth Over Tribe. We're so glad that we got to talk to you. So, Keith, where can people go to listen to your podcast, maybe get your book, you know, find out about your church in, what did you say, Columbia, right? Columbia, Missouri. Let, Columbia, let's just Missouri. say this. You can get the book off Amazon or any place else that you buy books. Uh, it's released on October 4th. We'd love for you to pick up a copy. And if you like it, uh, let us know. And if you disagree, let us know that too. We also put out a podcast once a week, every Wednesday, a new episode drops of Truth Over Tribe. <laughs> <laughs>